Let's talk about Sorcerer Schemes, Inferno Bolts, and Dusty Rubrique with an overview of the Thousand Suns in 10th edition Warhammer 40k. Hello and welcome back to Warsbets Tactics, where today we're talking through the Thousand Suns Index and talking through each and every option available to Magnus's Sorcerous Legion of Zinch. At time of recording, the Thousand Suns seem to be in a pretty good place in Warhammer 40k in general. Certainly one of the armies at the upper end of the power curve with the ability to put together some enormous damage combos, and at least the vast majority of their more iconic units are very usable in game right now, including Magnus himself, which is kind of fun. In this video we'll talk through the Thousand Suns Index, a fairly typical index within Warhammer 40k. They've got their Cabal of Sorcerers faction rule that allows them to dish out some psychic powers each turn. All of those are rather nice and you trade out points for some enormously powerful abilities. Their launch detachment is the Cult of Magic detachment, that gives them a buff called Kindred Sorcery to their psychic spells. And they've got some access to some rather good stratagems and enhancements, generally tending to be focused around making their ranged sorcery go even further. Then they've got their list of data sheets, the rubrics, Scarab Occult Terminators, Zangors, a whole bunch of sorcerers and some vehicles. Their points costs are in the Munitorum Field Manual and we'll go through them as we do. And I would bear in mind that you can have options from outside of Index Thousand Suns as well. If you want a bit of direct fire support you could look at things like Wardog Brigands from Chaos Knights and a fair few people seem to take along things like Deep Striking Zinch Flamers and the Changeling. Helpful to have some things pop up to do secondary things and skirmish with infantry on objectives. Let's get into all the sorcerers tricks though, and we'll start out with the army rule Cabal of Sorcerers, which I think went down rather well in general for Thousand Suns players. A lot of people were initially very disheartened that the psychic phase was going away, but Thousand Suns kind of get one with this. The way it works is that your psychers on the board all generate points, and then you can spend those points on a few powerful cabalistic rituals each turn. I think that literally all of them are interesting and powerful in the right situation. In terms of how many of these points you can expect to generate, Magnus gets you four, Araman gets you three, most of the character sorcerers get you two besides the generic sorcerer which is just one. The squad leader sorcerers also get you one as well, as does the Zangor Shaman. There are a few other datasheet abilities that allow you to manipulate or generate them, plus things with enhancements as well, so you can game it a little bit more than this. Overall I feel like quite a lot of 2000 point lists could easily be generating around about 15 points worth of cabalistic rituals right from the start of the game without even really trying to build around it that hard. Most Thousand Suns armies tend to go at least fairly character heavy, though things could drop off a bit towards the end of the game if you do start to lose sorcerers and squads. The Cabal points can be spent on 5 different rituals, these cost between 2 and 9 points, so basically you're not going to be able to do all of them. You're going to have to pick and choose which ones you think are going to have the biggest impacts on the game. You can only use each one once per phase, so you can't say just spend all of your things on multiple instances of Doombolt for example. Not unless you've got some other ability that allows you to double up, and you do have to trigger these at the start of each phase, which does actually make them a little bit more limited. You actually have to decide whether or not you're using them right before you get any information about how well you've managed to shoot at things for example. In general, for the most part, they affect units within 18 inches of a Psyker, though a Mutalith can make that a bit bigger. And then if you don't manage to use all of your Cabal points, the pull resets to zero at the start of your next command phase, so anything unused is kind of wasted. Going through the rituals individually, and as I said, I do think that literally all of them are very usable and very powerful in the right situation. Weaver of Fates is the cheapest, and this one's just two points, so it's quite a nice one to hoover up any extra points that you've not managed to neatly spend. This one allows you to re-roll a saving throw for a unit within 18 inches, though you do have to commit to spending it at the start of the phase, not when you've failed a saving throw or taken damage or anything. I can definitely see this being one that people try and use reactively. It does force you to be a bit more on it and actually commit to it early, as you wouldn't technically be allowed to have the information as to whether or not you passed or failed a save. Still though, if you've got an important unit that's just about to be gunned down by some really high damage shots, this one definitely looks like it could be worth triggering, particularly if it's the enemy turn and you've only got a couple of points left over. A coin flip chance to save a Terminator's life on a 4 plus invulnerable save seems nice enough, and it could be really powerful against bigger things as well. Say if you took a massive melter hit to Magnus or something like that and he fails a save, having a good chance to pass it again does seem very nice. Temporal Surge is 5 Cabal points, this one allows you to double move a unit but you can't charge afterwards. A very nice mobility one this one. Perhaps particularly nice for making slower moving Thousand Suns units put a bit more pressure in. Could be nice to maybe get a big block of Warp Flame Rubric Marines in range. Or perhaps move up some Scarab Occult Terminators to take the midfield objective right from turn 1. 
and it doesn't compromise them on being able to shoot either, so you can still open fire when you do that. Could maybe be really quite nice late game as well for jumping around and getting some lines of sight on crucial enemy units that are trying to hide. On paper it seems pretty massive on Magnus, he's got a massive great big 14 inch move, so you could double move him for a crazy 28 inch movement. A really good chance to unleash his absolutely massive damage output on something that thought it might have been safe. Then moving upwards to the more expensive ones, Echoes from the Warp is 6 points. This one allows you to use a stratagem for 0 CP on this unit. This one does have to be the Psyker's own unit though, it can't be one within 18 inches unlike most of the rest of them. This one can be one that you've already used this phase, so it could allow you to double dip on something big like making weapons into psychic attacks for example. And it could be quite nice for more expensive ones like the 2 command point warp sight, which allows you to fire out of line of sight with your shooting. This one could be a very helpful part in making the great big thousand suns damage combo stick together. It can layer a lot of stratagems with psychic attacks and potentially obliterate big threats off the table if you get them all stacked up in the right way, and this could easily be part of that. Then for 7 Cabal points there's Doombolt, this one's trading Cabal points for direct damage, pick one unit that you can see within 18 inches of your Psyker, roll a d6 and for most results you'll get a big d3 plus 3 mortal wounds, on a 1 you get a measly d3, but on a 6 you get an absolutely whopping d3 plus 6. I think in general that's going to be quite a good trade off, very good against very big heavily armoured things. Could be nice at shaving off a whole bunch of wounds from enemy knights or super heavies for example, or perhaps a character that doesn't have mortal wound protection but has some very good saves or invulnerable saves. I believe to my knowledge that this will be able to attack things with lone operatives, it sounds like it's a shooting attack but it actually isn't worded as one, it means that you could potentially fry something like an Ekron Hexmark Destroyer from out of attack range, and it also could be quite good to apply some precision damage to an area of the board where you don't really have that much to threaten the enemy units there. Say for example if you just had say a weak depleted Rubik Marine squad holding onto an objective against a much bigger enemy threat, throwing a doom bolt at them could perhaps surprise the enemy and swing a bad situation into a good one. It's also not really restricted to any of the other normal shooting restrictions, so you could still fall back and fire a doom bolt if you wanted, as it's not a standard shooting attack. Finally, and perhaps the biggest, scariest, intimidating one is Twist of Fate for 9 points. This one's got a massive cost, and I think a lot of the time it's going to eat up around about half your Cabal points or more. This one's nice and simple, but pretty massively devastating. Until the end of the phase, armor saving throws cannot be made for models in the unit that's targeted within 18 inches of your Psyker. This is just absolutely massive on anything that was surviving on a tanky 2 plus or 3 plus save and doesn't have any sort of invulnerable means that anything that stacks a bunch of volume fire and gets some chip wounds should whistle them down very very quickly as the opponent's saving absolutely nothing against it. Provided you've got enough volume shots to stack a bunch of wounds on them, you can pretty much guarantee that almost every unit in the game is going to go down against that unless they're protected by very high invulnerables or good feel no pains. Between this and the stacked psychic shooting combos it does mean that you can basically remove the vast majority of units from the board in a single round of shooting if you do focus all your resources and buffs against one target. Definitely a one that can punish any armies with really big high investment units this one. Overall I think they've done really quite well with the Cabal of Sorcerers buffs. Literally all of them seem quite usable and they have weighted them quite well depending on which ones are more valuable and less valuable. And I feel like it's gone some way to preserving Thousand Suns as an army where you have really quite a lot of options to draw on, and it's all about selecting the right ones for the situation. Moving on to their launch detachment, and the Thousand Suns get the Cult of Magic detachment, their generic one. This one seems to be one all about flinging witch fires at your opponent and hitting them hard with devastating sorcery, much as the lore for the Cult of Magic has been in the past. The standard boost that it gives you is Kindred Sorcery. This one's a boost to your psychic attacks, both range and in melee and you get to choose it in the command phase, you either get lethal hits on everything, sustained hits 1, or devastating wounds. Psychic attacks are obviously really quite common in Thousand Suns, though they aren't everywhere. Inferno bolt weapons aren't psychic attacks, nor is the Mutilith Warp Vortex Beast's Warp Vortex. It's generally mostly just the Sorcerers and Squad Sorcerers, lots of those have decent enough psychic shooting. And there is a stratagem called Ensorcelled Infusion to make some shooting attacks from Inferno Bolts into Psychic Weapons, and that could stack with this as well as allowing huge combos with other things. Out of those boosts I think that all three of them are potentially usable. Lethal Hits is likely to be the best if you're wounding on a 5 plus with those Psychic attacks across the board. Sustained Hits 1 is equal on a 4 plus or better if you're wounding on a 3 plus against your targets. And Devastating Wounds is kind of interesting, it depends on exactly what you're going to be using with the Psychic Attacks. A fair few of the Psychic Attacks that Thousand Suns have already get Devastating Wounds, things like Magnus's main damaging attack, 
plus the psychic spell of a couple of sorcerers have it already, so they're not going to gain anything from there, and it might actually be a little bit less potent than the others if you were going to use Twist of Fate on one big target. There might be less value in Mortal Wounds if it was going to go through the armor saves anyway. Overall quite nice and flexible though, you can just choose the one that you think is going to be most useful at the start of each turn, depending on exactly what targets you think your sorcerers are likely to have. Then for stratagems for the Cult of Magic, it starts off with Psychic Dominion. This one I'd say is maybe the most situational, as it gives you a 4 plus feel no pain against psychic weapons, and also makes any psychic weapons hazardous when they attack your units. Often a bit of a dud one, that one, it's going to be entirely useless in some matchups, but probably weirdly nicest against other things like Other Thousand Suns, or maybe things like Tyranid Zone Thropes. Both parts of the rule are supposed to be useful enough if you are about to take a bunch of damage from a whole load of units dealing psychic attacks. For 1 CP, there's Destined by Fate. This one's one command point to cancel a failed save for a Psycho model. I guess this in particular is the one to use when Magnus takes a hit from a Railgun or something similar. Could also be pretty nice on things like Mutilith Vortex Beasts or Vehicles perhaps. Anything that you're just about to take an excessive amount of wounds on because you've just failed a save against a close range Melter or something with another really high damage characteristic like a Necron Gauss weapon. Flipping a damage to a flat zero for one command point I think will often be worth it depending on what else you want the CP for or whether you're lining up any other combos. I think it's also quite powerful that you get to know whether or not you pass or fail the save before choosing the option of flipping the damage characteristic to zero. It means that you never waste this on a save that you would have passed anyway. Next up for one command point there's Devastating Sorcery. This one is a massive boost to psychic damage. Reroll all hits and wound rolls for psychic attacks at range. Rerolling all hits and wounds is an enormous damage boost, but in reality there's only a few units that you'd really want to use it on, as most of them don't concentrate psychic attacks. Magnus himself I think is well worth it, and he already has plus one to hit and plus one to wound, so there's a good chance you're converting the vast majority of his dice rolls into successful wounds there. He could even do a bit of fishing for devastating wounds if that was the most important thing. However, it's perhaps even better with an Ensorcelled Infusion squad of Scarab Occult Terminators. The next stratagem below allows you to turn your guns into psychic weapons. Speaking of which, Ensorcelled Infusion is a shooting phase buff for one command point. Basically, your Inferno weapons, your Inferno bolters, combi bolters, bolt pistols, and combi weapons all gain a psychic ability and get a strength characteristic of 5. The plus 1 strength could be useful against the right targets, but getting that psychic keyword on them is pretty massive for all sorts of other boosts. Comboing with others of the stratagems like Devastating Sorcery, it allows you to get access to the Kindred Sorcery buff, say some lethal hits on those bolters. Magnus could give a unit plus one to hit and wound with his psychic aura, and he could combine it with warp sights to fire some guns out of line of sight as well. This one perhaps feels like a bit of a setup stratagem maybe. The main actual boost that you get going to strength 5 is kind of okay but not standout, but just with the sheer amount of things that you have the option to layer on top of that, and it can get very very silly very fast. Next for one command point we've got Sorcerer's Might, this one's a plus 9 inch range to psychic weapons, again could maybe be fed into the damage combo, or perhaps allow Magnus's psychic attacks to go out at a bigger range and hit something really quite a long way away. Probably a little bit lower value this one, ideally you'd want to try and get within the range if you possibly could, but occasionally it's going to make the difference between shooting something important and not doing so. Finally and for a more expensive 2 CP there's Warp Sight, this one allows you to mark a target with 1000 Sun Psyche units, and then when other 1000 Sun Psyche units make an attack with a psychic weapon, they gain indirect fire and ignores cover against the target that you nominated, so you'd be able to fire your barrages of spells out of line of sight, Again, probably most relevant on Magnus or Scarab Occults with Ensorcelled Infusion. At 2 CP, it's probably one of the better ones to use with that Kabbalistic Ritual that gives you a free stratagem for the phase. But otherwise, though, it could just be situationally really quite good. Again, if it makes the difference between Magnus having a good target for his big psychic damage attacks or not having one at all. Overall, really quite powerful stratagems here, particularly when layered all in one big wombo combo. A lot of them really are targeted to psychic attacks, though, of one sort or another and it does mean that a fair few of the units just aren't really all that efficient for being able to do that that much. As mentioned, for a bunch of them, it's likely going to be Magnus or Inferno Combi Bolters from Scarab Occult, but I think that these things will happily eat most of the command points and reward you for doing so. Otherwise, besides that, I do quite like the one command point one to just flip a set failed save to damage zero. There's going to be a lot of the times in games where that's going to be more than worth it. Moving on to enhancements next, and the Thousand Suns do have some good ones, Lord of Forbidden Law is 25 points, and this one allows you to double down on rituals but still have to pay the cost for them. It means, say, you could throw out two Doom Bolts in a turn if that made sense, 
or use two free stratagems if that was what you wanted to do. This one does seem to be really quite a common one to run competitively. Definitely helpful to have the flexibility to hit the enemy with the exact ritual they don't want twice over. I think there might be a bit of an element of trading out just good options for other good options though. Most of the table is really quite powerful and you're probably not going to be using all of it. You might just be doubling down on one good option, but others could have been pretty much equally effective, even if a little bit less so. Still seems good enough to get the cut for the majority of competitive lists though. Next up for 20 points we've got the Athenaean Scrolls. This one's a nice simple one that just generates you one extra Cabal point. I'd say it's not awful but kind of a bit borderline at 20 points really as to how much that's going to be worth it. I guess if you've got leftover points and literally nothing else that you want to use them up on then that one could be alright. Ideally you'd want it on a character that you think is likely to survive until the later end of the game. Then the one that I'd probably rate as perhaps the single best one is the Umbralific Crystal. 20 points for a once per game teleport to anywhere 9 inches away from the enemy. Really quite a nice one punch movement trick that the Thousand Sons can have. I guess you'd usually want to use this to deliver mass warp flamers onto the target or a big block of Scarab Occult Terminators to line up some shooting combos. Seems really good to me, guarantees that you get the Alpha Strike on the opponent pretty much and you can use it in turn 1 as well. So potentially start hitting the enemy and keep them pinned in their deployment from the get go. Unlike a few similar rules out there as well, there's nothing to state that you can't use it when you're in engagement range, so it could be one way that allows you to basically teleport out of combat and still fire without having to technically fall back. I think this one's well worth it in just about every list really. Finally there's Arcane Vortex, this one's 15 points and gives you plus 1 strength and plus 1 damage to the bearer's psychic weapons. As only 15 points I think this one's pretty usable really, probably not usually going to actually change the world or make a psyker into an awesome damage powerhouse. But a fair few of the sorcerers do have some at least fairly punchy witch fires that plus one damage will be kind of nice on and it also helps out with their melee attacks as well. Again it might be a nice use of 15 points if you did need something to round up a list, not really a bad pick to be honest. Overall I think they've done fairly well to make all four of the enhancements at least fairly playable to the extent where you could want to take them. My favourite is definitely that Umbralific Crystal for the big teleport. Lots of competitive lists like to use that Lord of Forbidden Law for doubling down on rituals. And the other two seem very usable, though not really stand out for those points costs I think comparatively. Overall I feel like the Thousand Sons really haven't done too badly out of their Cult of Magic detachment. Definitely one that amps up psychic firepower so it's really quite nice for sorcerers, magnus and big blocks of shooting that you make into psychic weapons. I guess when the codex eventually comes out for 10th edition the other cults might be released and give them different play options that might emphasise different builds. Getting onto data sheets now though, and in the battle line for the Thousand Suns, they've got the options for the Rubric Marines and Zangors to take more data sheets of them. Both of those are also objective control too, so they hold down objectives a little bit better. Scarab Occult Terminators and regular Thousand Suns cultists both aren't battle line, and they both have objective control 1. In particular, that's quite a big downgrade for the Terminators, they used to be objective secured in 9th edition. Otherwise, the majority of data sheets have broadly stayed the same. Perhaps the biggest changes between 9th edition and 10th are that things like Araman and the Exalted Sorcerer both have split data sheets between disc and versus no disc. The Exalted one actually gets a different psychic power as well depending on whether he's on a disc or not, so adds a little bit more variety with buffing units. The Demon Princes also have the split data sheet between wings versus no wings, and again different rules for the two of them. And another fairly unfortunate big change for the Thousand Sons recently was having all of their Horus Heresy Forge World stuff go to Legends. I know at least a few players had either Chaos Contempt to Dreadnoughts or Leviathans in the mix. Kind of sad that they've lost those options for a little bit of heavy lifting fire support. They do have some okay in codex options though with things like Forge Fiends, Predator Annihilators or maybe some allied Wardog Brigands. Getting into the data sheets properly though and let's start out with the Rubrique with the Rubric Marines and the Scarab Occult Terminators. Rubric Marines don't seem to have done too badly out of 10th edition, 5 to 10 models in the squad. 95 points for 5 or 190 for 10 and a slightly slow 5 inch moving space marine profile though you do get a 5 plus invulnerable save so they're a bit more tanky against high AP than most. They are quite good for taking objectives, objective control 2 and a leadership of 6 plus, they aren't fearless anymore though so they do have the ability to take battle shock. For their main weapons you either get the choice between the inferno bolt gun or the warp flamer for free now. Out of the two I feel like the warp flamer is solidly better compared with the bolt gun. They both hit with the same strength for AP-1 profile, the bolt is getting 2 shots out to 24 inches, but I feel like the warp flamer is probably the better choice just for the solidly better damage at 12 that auto hits. 
If you can get within the 12 inch range, then the Warp Flamer will average around about triple the damage of the Inferno Bolt Gun. The Baltic could still be useful for some of the Sorcerer buffs though, with things like lethal hits, plus potentially in Sorcerer ammunition if you want to use it on Rubric Marines, though it seems better on Scarabs. Otherwise you get one Soul Reaper Cannon per squad, fairly solid firepower with 6 shots, strength 6, AP 1 and devastating wounds, really quite nice to just chip away at just about anything. And the aspiring sorcerer leading the squad gets a couple of mini attacks, an anti-infantry warp smite with AP3 and devastating wounds, and then either a plasma or warp flame pistol. I think I might be most tempted by the warp flame with a bunch of auto hits at strength 3 and AP1. Otherwise for their special rules they get quite a solid damage boost against enemies on objectives. The bringers of change special rule allows them to reroll wound rolls of 1, and then reroll all wound rolls if you target something on an objective, making them really quite nice for purging foes with warp flamers there, and it's quite nice for the soul reaper cannon and fishing for devastating wounds as well. Finally their icon of flame can allow them to increase the AP of their attacks by 1 if they get a critical wound, again something that could be a little bit more likely if they're rerolling all wound rolls, so you might be getting some AP2 hits out of the warp flamers or inferno bolt guns. Overall I think they're really quite a solid battle line unit, usually running good numbers in competitive lists with characters joining them, and they often do tend to get built out beyond just the 5 model squad. Lots of squads with warp flamers can be quite powerful for fighting over objectives, and can be quite a nice choice for the umbralific crystal to jump around with. Next up we've got the Scarab Occult Terminators, 5 or 10 models in the unit, either for 205 points or 410. They've got the big and chunky 10th edition Terminator profile with a toughness of 5, a 2 plus save, 3 wounds and a big 4 plus invulnerable, definitely going to be very redoubtable to shift, and they also get a minus 1 to wound if they've got a Psyker in the unit, so I guess that's while the Scarab of Court Sorcerer is still alive, or if they have a character to join them. For their weapons, they get the Inferno Combi Bolt as their base, as we mentioned quite a lot of times already, they're the ones that you can really build around with the damage combo, making them Psychic weapons for strength 5, re-rolling a whole bunch of wound rolls, getting further buffs from Psychers and the Kindred Sorcerers thing, and potentially plus one to hit and wound from Magnus. Two of the squad may as well also take some Hellfire missiles on their shoulders, two shots each at strength 10, AP 2 and damage 3, so quite nice for handling some medium armour. And then you can take some Soul Reaper cannons, seems like they're pretty much auto-include as a big boost over the Inferno Combi Bolters if you're not building around big damage combos. If you are though, they're perhaps a little bit more questionable, They'll take a few psychic shots away from your squad, and that might actually be worse than their boosted profile at strength 6 and devastating wounds that they get at the moment. Then in melee they get to attack with those Prosperine Kapeshes, each one gets 3 attacks at strength 5, AP 2 and damage 2, so fairly solid at killing elite infantry there. The Aspiring Sorcerer can also chip in with his force weapon, and he gets a little Warp Smite psychic attack that gets anti-infantry 4+, plus. the same as the Rubrics, but appearing to get 1 extra attack compared with them. Overall again seem to be a very solid competitive unit for the Thousand Sons, a lot of competitive lists seem to run one absolutely massive block of these, a full squad of 10 backed up by a Terminator Sorcerer, and layer on as many buffs as he possibly can onto them. He could start them on the board and maybe think about double moving them up, or he could potentially deep strike them, maybe even using Rapid Ingress. Moving on to Cultist and Zangor units next, first up we've got the Thousand Sons Cultist squad, this one's 10 or 20 models for either 65 or 130 points, Slightly boosted on the regular cultist stat line, they get a 6 plus invulnerable save because Zinch likes to save people every so often I suppose, and they also get the scout 6 inches move which allows them to take up some positions in the midfield which is kind of handy. Otherwise they're only leadership 7 and objective control 1, so not quite as sure objective holders as maybe the Zangors are. They can chip in with at least a little bit of interesting shooting, they now get both a flamer, a grenade launcher and a heavy stubber all included in the unit for free. Might just do a little bit of surprise chip damage to your opponent that wasn't really expecting that. And then even if they do die, then they add a little bit to the cause. If you roll a d6, then you get a 2 plus to generate a command point. Something they also get if they actually manage to kill a unit, though I'd say that that's far less likely. Overall, I don't think they're too bad for expendable bodies, even if they do pay a bit of a premium on other cultists. Particularly with the free command point, if they do get wiped, they do seem like quite nice expendable units to move up to midfield objectives. They're definitely going to get compared against things like Zangors and Enlightened though. Speaking of which, the Zangors are now the exact same cost as Cultists, 65 points for 10 or 130 for 20. They're the other battle line unit of the Thousand Sons and get Objective Control too, and they may be a little bit more certain Objective Holders than Cultists as they do get to re-roll Battleshock, so you have a bit less chance of them surprisingly failing it. 
For their war gear, they either hit with mass strength 5, AP minus 1 melee that hits on a 4 plus, or they get 3 attacks with strength 4 plus an auto pistol. Those two options seem at least fairly balanced to me. On the defensive, they get toughness 4 and a 6 plus invulnerable save, and if they're on an objective, they farm a cabal point each turn on a 4 plus. Overall, they seem at least usable for things like home field objective holders, a little bit tougher than cultists perhaps, farming you a few extra command points, and can at least threaten to bully light infantry that get too close with a whole flurry of light infantry type attacks. I feel like maybe a unit or two could be usable, though I probably wouldn't build around them for damage or anything like that. Next up, we've got Zangor Enlightened, 45 points for 3 of them, or 90 points for 6. That makes them really quite a tiny expendable unit that's really quite nice to have. And they even get the bonus on top of that of having quite a good movement as well at movement 10. It makes them pretty much an ideal unit for moving around and trading on objectives and things, or running around trying to do secondary objectives. They do count as a mounted unit, which means that they won't be able to zip straight over terrain. They will actually have to move up and round things. And on the defence, they may be a tiny bit fragile for the 15 points. Toughness 4, a 5 plus save with a 6 plus invulnerable, and 2 wounds. Not ridiculously easy to kill, but a lot of things will go through that very fast. For their war gear choices, they get either the Fake Caster Great Bow, two shots hitting on fours at strength 5, AP 1, damage 2, and they get lethal hits and precision. Really not too bad sniper fire for the points, I think. Or they can take a Divining Spear for some actually fairly threatening melee. Three attacks hitting at strength 5, AP minus 2, and damage 1 with Lance, so usually plus 1 to wound there. And they also have precision as well, so they might opportunistically be able to take out a very light character. I feel like those two war gear choices are pretty well balanced to me either at least somewhat dangerous in range or melee, take your pick. Finally, their special rule is really quite a good one for an annoying interference unit. Malign Trickery means that if an enemy unit moves within 9 inches, they get to make a reactive normal move of d6 inches, potentially doing some shenanigans like keeping them out of line of sight, or moving directly away from an enemy unit that was threatening to charge them. Overall, just for being really quite cheap nuisance units and doing that role really quite well, it does seem that they get quite commonly played in competitive lists, perhaps in some preference to things like cultists, zangors and spawn, all of which are perhaps competing for the low investment objective holders or small nuisance units role. While we're on zangors, I thought it might make sense to talk about the zangor shaman ahead of the rest of the characters. He's 60 points and can lead either the zangor enlightened or the regular zangors. He's mounted on a disc that gives him extra movement, and he's got at least a fairly fragile defensive profile with 4 wounds and a 6 plus invulnerable save. He can chip in with a little bit of threat on his own. He's got mutating orbs, a devastating wound blast attack. It is only AP 0 though. And then attacks with a shaman stave in combat. Really his main purpose in life is to give the unit two fairly powerful special rules. While he's leading a unit he gets a 5 plus feel no pain type save. And he also grants the unit a plus 1 to hit as well. So solidly better both damage and defence there. Overall, I think you'd probably still want to have to take a big unit of either Zangors or Enlightened to really make him worth it. For around 60 points, you could take an entire full squad of Zangor Enlightened or most of a squad of Zangors, and I feel like he might well be weighed up against just taking more individual units of your goat bird people. Though I think if you did want to field a bigger Zangor or Enlightened unit to actually do some damage threat, it looks like he'd be pretty reasonable to include for that role. Might be a bit of a pass for more hyper-optimised competitive lists though. I think in general you'd probably want your Zangors cheap and cheerful and holding objectives for minimal investment. Finally for the cultists and mutants, we've got the Thousand Suns spawn. These guys get two models for 65 points. Unfortunately you can no longer field them in individual models for maximal disruption or big units that could actually take some unlikely buffs and be a bit of a cheap charge threat. Stats wise they've got a toughness of 5, a 4 plus save with a 5 plus invulnerable and a 5 plus feel no pain. Between all that, they are at least fairly tough to take out and need a bit of focused fire, and if the opponent damages one but doesn't kill it, it's likely going to be regenerating back up to full health, as it regains d3 wounds in both players' command phase. In combat, they get a flurry of strength 5, AP 1, and damage 2 attacks. Not exactly the most exciting threat for the points when they hit on a 4+, plus, but they've at least got a fair chance of mauling a couple of space marines there. And I guess at least compared with some of the other factions' chaos spawns, getting an invulnerable save is quite nice. It does make them a little bit more resilient. Still not sure I'd be too tempted to take them though, compared with things like the regular Zangors or Cultists or Enlightened. Maybe just feel like they're, like they're a little bit behind those point for point. Though I guess the right sort of squads that don't quite have enough threats to properly kill one reliably could be annoyed and ground down by them per turn as they regenerate repeatedly. Moving on though, next I thought we'd go for Thousand Sons characters and sorcerers, considering how integral they are to the army. And then after that talk about the Mutalith Vortex Beast, 
and all of their demon engines and vehicles. Leading the way with the characters, we've got Magnus the Red, the Primarch himself, 410 points and must be your warlord. And Magnus is really looking so much better than he was back in 9th edition, really quite a competitive staple at the moment. Both having some pretty massive damage stats coming out of him, and also acting as a bit of a psychic linchpin for the army. Stats wise, he's got a big toughness 11, 2 plus save, 16 wounds and a 4 plus invulnerable, and he'll usually have a minus 1 damage, as I think that's probably one of the most reliable ones for his choice of buffs each turn. He moves 14 inches and gets an objective control of 6, so it will be a threat to any objectives that he's standing on, and you probably won't be able to keep away from him too well for too long. It is also quite nice that he doesn't have the towering keyword as well, that means that he can actually hide himself behind obscuring ruins now, though in practice it might still be a little bit hard to hide that absolutely enormous wingspan, unless you can get either multiple ruins in the way or have him side on or something. His main special rule is Lord of the Planet of the Sorcerers. This one gives him a very powerful aura buff where he gets to add plus one to the hit roll and plus one to the wound roll of any thousand sun psyche units within six inches firing psychic attacks. Both of those bits are pretty massive buffs in their own right, the plus one to hit and the plus one to wound. It's really massive with that ensorcelled infusion that you can give to the Scarab Occult Terminator weapons. He gets it on his own attacks as well and he's got some very mighty psychic ranged weapons and pretty mighty melee as well. All of that will have plus one to wound, even if it already hits on a two plus. That's certainly helpful enough for any other sorcerers that happen to be around, making their magic far more devastating. For his own damage output though, it really is quite monstrous. Gaze of Magnus is 3d3 attacks with devastating wounds, all at strength 9, AP 2 and damage 3. A pretty massive generalist profile with plus one to wound that one. And he follows that up with Zinch's Firestorm, d6 plus 3 shots with blast, all hitting at strength 5, AP 1 and damage 2. Very solid for clearing out hordes, and he'll still be wounding things like Toughness 9 vehicles on a 4 plus due to his own plus 1 to wound once more. They'll also get buffs from Kindred Sorcery, and he could also use the full rerolls to hit and wound for 1 CP for the stratagem. Then in combat, he also gets plus 1 to wound here as well. The Blade of Magnus either gives you 7 attacks at strength 16, AP 3, and damage 3, or 14 attacks at strength 8, AP 1, and damage 1 against hordes. He really can put out a massive amount of damage between one round of psychic and one round of combat. And then for his other buffs, he gets you four cabal points each turn, and then the choice of either a minus one damage, a plus two inch movement aura, or making it enemy weapons hazardous for a turn. Out of those, I feel like against the majority of the armies, the minus one damage is probably going to be the best. Maybe you could use the movement one either early game or late game to get your army moving where they need to go. I suppose the hazardous one could be situationally kind of useful. I guess it could be kind of horrible on certain units that have a whole ton of ranged weapons, but I feel like that one's going to be a bit more niche. Overall though, he definitely has the raw damage to carry himself. He's massively tougher to take out than he used to be, with a toughness of 11, the 2 plus save that he should easily be able to get cover with, and also being able to hide, and he's making a lot of appearances competitively as well. Perhaps borderline ought to include for a lot of Thousand Sons armies. It's very nice to see the Primarch back on form. Moving on, we've got the rest of the Sorcerers. The Exalted Sorcerer is 90 points. Besides the Terminator Sorcerer, most of the rest of the Thousand Suns characters can only go with Rubric Marines, making them kind of necessary if you want to run these. The Exalted one is Toughness 4, 5 wounds with a 4 plus invulnerable save, and he brings to the table an Astral Blast Smite type attack with Strength 6, AP 2 and Damage D3. A bunch of Damage 2 attacks hitting in melee, and he gives his units two fairly good buffs, Rubik Marines getting a 4 plus invulnerable save, and also the ability to act like a medic for them pretty much, putting them back together. Rolling a 2 plus to rise 1 from the ground where it had fallen each turn. Overall really quite a strong sorcerer I think. Seems fairly ideal to have on a unit of Rubik Marines heading towards midfield objectives to make them tougher and last longer, and chipping in with a bit of his own damage as well. The Exalted Sorcerer can also be fielded on a disc of Zeench as well, this one costs 15 points more than the regular one, though the extra movement is perhaps only borderline useful given that he's still tied to Rubric Marines. I guess could give him a bit more movement to get line of sight on things for Kabbalistic rituals and things, or maybe make charges shorter should you wish to charge. Otherwise it also gives him one extra wound as well, so he's a tiny bit tougher. And while most of his data sheet is fairly similar, he gets a very slightly different witch fire called Arcane Fire. No devastating wounds on this one, but it gets Torrent instead, so it auto hits. And then rather than the Rebind Rubrique special rule, where he puts rubrics back together, 
Instead, he gets to target an enemy unit within 18 inches, and that targeted unit gets to half their movement characteristic and also half the results of advance and charge rolls. I feel like that really is quite a powerful ability, to be honest. You could just throw that on any very valuable unit that your opponent has at the front of their army and have a good chance of stopping it from getting into the fight. Seems probably best if your opponent's got a big melee Death Star of some sort, maybe a big block of Custodes or some other enemy Terminators. I feel like perhaps it's a little bit less reliably good, but still really, really powerful in the right situation. Next up, we've got the regular Thousand Sun Sorcerer, 85 points and again leading Rubric Marines. Compared with the Exalted, he gets a slightly worse stat line. He only gets a 5 plus invulnerable save, 1 less wound, and doesn't hit quite as accurately in combat, but otherwise it's fairly similar. His psyche attack is called Fires of the Abyss. This one allows you to throw out 2d6 shots with sustained hits 3, all at strength 5, AP 1, and damage 1, so that should get you really quite a lot of hits against infantry, very good for clearing hordes. For his abilities, he grants lethal hits to the unit, so it might be a little bit better on things with the bolt guns as opposed to the warp flamers perhaps, and also gives you the powerful ability in that his unit that he's leading can't be shot by enemies that are greater than 18 inches away. Between those two, seems like it could be pretty interesting perhaps for a small unit of rubrics trying to take an objective that's slightly further away from the enemy firebase. Unless they get close, you can absolutely guarantee that they wouldn't be able to shoot your squad and he could help them out with longer ranged weapons that they might favour, getting a few lethal hits out of some bolters and soul reaper cannons, and chipping away at the enemy from slightly longer range. Then to lead the Scarab Occult Terminators, there's the Sorcerer in Terminator armour, 105 points, and getting slightly chunkier stats than most of the rest of them, a toughness of 5, a 2 plus save, 5 wounds and a 4 plus invulnerable. His flavour of psychic damage is Coruscating Flames, this one chips in with 3 attacks at strength 4 and damage 2, and gets anti-vehicle 4 plus and devastating wounds as well, so perhaps one that's extra good at killing big stuff. Like the regular sorcerer on foot, his ability is also to get lethal hits for the unit, really quite nice with a whole bunch of inferno combi bolt of fire, and he also gets to double down with some damage dealing by marking one enemy unit, and your entire army gets to re-roll hit rolls of one against that squad for the rest of the turn, and that applies both at range and in melee. Quite nice that you get to trigger that at the start of your shooting phase, so you do get to move before you have to designate the targets, and it does also mean that he could use that after he comes down from Deep Strike Reserve. Overall, between his raw stats, his extra bit of shooting, and his buffs, I think is really good value for the Scarab Occult Terminators, plus you could use him to bear certain enhancements like the Umbralific Crystal or Forbidden Law. Overall, looks like a solid choice if you do want to build around a great big tanky Scarab Occult block with all the buffs. Finally, for the more mainstream sorcerers, we've also got the Infernal Master, 75 points for the man with the Demon Packs, similar kind of stats to a regular sorcerer, and his main damage is a fairly potent flamer that's good for killing infantry. If he risks the hazardous roll, it's 2d6 hits at strength 6, AP 2, and damage 1, which is quite nice, I think. Maybe it could be one of the better choices for that enhancement that increases the damage of a psychic weapon. I feel like his buffs are a little less exciting, though. He adds sustained hits 1 for a unit, which I think is often going to be less good than the lethal hits that the regular sorcerer gets, and for a second buff it's just a personal auto 6, once per turn changing one result to an automatic 6 for him himself. That would be a bit more powerful if he had a few bigger single hitting weapons, as opposed to a flamer attack, as opposed to if you choose the devastating wounds buff out of the kindred sorcerers, it could guarantee that you get at least one mortal wound through. I'm not sure if that's really quite enough to make it exciting though. Overall, at the moment, he seems to be perhaps the very least favoured of the sorcerers. Most people think that the regular sorcerer adds a bit more between his lethal hits and his unable to be shot at 18 inches. I feel like it's perhaps the second part of the buff that really wins out between those personal auto sixes that this guy gets. It's perhaps a shame that his buffs don't work a bit better for warp flamers as well, as they seem like the models that would be most similar to his big damage flamer that he gets personally. Next up, we have the maker of the rubric himself with Mr. Araman. He's 110 points now, so it's about the same cost as a bunch of the other sorcerers, not significantly more. And he has a data sheet split in two now, one with a disc and one without, though the differences are kind of minor. His range attack is maybe a bit of a letdown compared with a few of the others. He gets just a single precision attack from Psychic Stalk, a strength 6, AP 1 and damage D6. Every so often you could get super lucky and kill a character with that, but I feel like it's not going to happen most of the time, particularly with AP minus 1. His combat's perhaps a bit more impressive though. He gets the Black Staff of Araman with 5 attacks at strength 7 and a big damage 3. Even if the AP isn't amazing, any failed saves will be felt quite big. The best things about him are definitely the buffs. He gets 3 Cabal of the Sorcerer points, so that certainly helps out with the rituals. 
It gives his unit a very nice plus one to wounds, pretty nice with warp flamers, bolters, or soul reapers, particularly combined with re-rolling wounds against things on objectives, that could be quite nice even against tough stuff. And perhaps biggest and best of all, he gets one free cabalistic ritual once per game, probably want to go for one of the higher value ones, either Twist of Fate or Doom Bolt, and perhaps use the cheaper ones elsewhere. Twist of Fate seems quite nice, particularly in combination with his plus one to wounds, between that and a whole bunch of warp flamers, you're probably going to remove really quite a lot of enemies from the board straight away. Overall, I still think he feels very solid for 110 points, really not all that expensive. I've definitely seen a fair few people saying that his rules just feel a little bit more bland now compared with what he could do before, with a huge amount of options of psychic powers, and now it's a fairly simple free cabalistic ritual and plus one to wound, and extra cabal points. He does have his alternative data sheet as well, fielded on a disc of Zinch. This one's just 5 points extra, and he still remains infantry. He doesn't get to be mounted or anything for that, which is definitely a positive. Kind of depends on whether you've got 5 points left over or not. He gains an extra 4 inch movement, the fly keyword, and an extra wound on his defence profile. Could potentially get him line of sight for his free cabalistic ritual, and could potentially make charges a bit easier by having him range out at the front of the squad if he did need to charge something to skirmish over some objectives. Lastly for the characters, we've got the Thousand Sons Demon Princes. There's the standard one at 210 points without the wings, a slight bit more expensive than the one with wings now. Like the other Chaos Demon Princes, these guys' stats have got a lot tougher. A toughness 10, a 2 plus save, and 10 wounds with a 4 plus invulnerable. And the on foot one gives an aura of stealth to nearby Thousand Sons for a minus 1 to hit, and that'll help keep him a little bit safer against ranged attacks as well. With all the anti-tank weapons going around and only 10 wounds though, it's still not super durability for 200 points. Otherwise, if he makes combat, he's got a fairly solid generalist melee at strength 8 and damage 3. His infernal cannon gets twice the shots of the regular warning codex chaos marines due to essentially incorporating the mark of zinch, I suppose. Six shots at a heavy bolter profile hitting on a 2+. plus. He gets that aura of stealth, which will genuinely increase the durability of the zinch battle line as it marches up. And finally, he gets a once per game ability to make one single friendly unit of either Rubik Marines or Scarab Occult Terminators, or get the precision keyword on their weapons, potentially giving them the power to snipe out a powerful enemy character hiding in a unit. Definitely going to be a lot more interesting against some armies than others, but could be kind of fun to throw that on some Scarab Occult Terminators, perhaps. He could fire the majority of their firepower one way, and then these slightly longer range Hellfire missiles into a character that thought they might have been safe, and try and get a lucky snipe. Looks like he gets taken in a couple of competitive lists, but not really all that many versus the other characters out there. He does seem to be a bit high investment at 210 points. Definitely adds some fun stuff to the army, but I feel like the stealth is maybe a little bit borderline for that kind of investment, as melee is kind of okay, but not super outstanding. You also have the option to field him with wings as well. This one makes him a fair bit more fast at 11 inch movement, and he costs 190 points. He loses a pip of toughness though, and the powerful buffing rules. This makes him a bit more of a single operative demon prince. He gets to blast enemies with sorceress fire as he moves over them. Roll 96, and for each 6 they suffer a mortal wound, so likely going to be 1 or 2. And he's got a fun rule called Ether Stride, which allows him to bound off the table at the end of the enemy turn and come back in your own reinforcement phase. That one could be handy for jumping around the board and threatening the enemy backfield or doing tactical objectives. I feel like at 190 points though, that's paying really quite a lot of a premium for that privilege. Though it does still seem like it could be fun to use, and if he uses that to pick some battles that he can easily win, it could definitely annoy the, an enemy army that hasn't managed to screen as well as they should. Still though, a bit pricey for his damage and defence, particularly as he's not really adding big buffs like the on foot demon prince. Finally, we come to the Thousand Suns Monsters and Vehicles. Starting out with their more unique thing, we've got the Mutalith Vortex Beast. 145 points for these, and these are just really monstrously powerful in 10th edition. Toughness 10, a 4 plus save with a 5 plus invulnerable. 13 wounds and a 5 plus feel no pain really makes their durability pretty stand out. The 5 plus feel no pain essentially means they've got around about 20 wounds in practice at that profile. And while their saving throw isn't particularly outstanding, that invulnerable save still means they'll get at least some save even against really high AP stuff like Melter. A lot of standard anti-tank weapons are just going to be pretty inefficient into them. Then it backs that up with three interesting ways of dealing damage. One really big shot from its warp vortex, either at a crazy strength 18 AP 4 and damage D6 plus 6, Unreliable, but gives you at least some chance of just scrapping one huge enemy vehicle in one shot. Or otherwise a Torrent Flamer that could be interesting for Overwatch with a bunch of Strength 6 AP 1 attacks. Or a Warp Vortex that's kind of good for killing Space Marines. Then he backs it up with some fairly solid combat. 
5 attacks at strength 9 and damage 4 is pretty nice against elite infantry. And he also has a small mortal wound attack as well that affects every enemy unit within 6 inches. If he can manage to get one or more of these into the midst of the enemy army, they are going to start doing chip damage against a whole bunch of squads at once. Overall they're just really solid all-rounders, being fairly dangerous and very very tough. And they can also help out with psychic rituals as well. The immaterial flare means that you can use cabalistic rituals for psychers that go out to 36 inches. I'd say probably most useful overall for throwing Doombolt out a really long way. Quite a few of the rest of them you probably want to have a psyker close by anyway. Overall I think it's really hard to go too far wrong with these. Really tanky and multiple threats. Your opponent's going to have to deal with them or suffer some big damage. Otherwise we've got the Thousand Sons Hellbrute. 145 points for a toughness 9, 2 plus save, 8 wound thing. This one also gets the Thousand Sons 5 plus invulnerable save as well. So it's a little bit more tough than Hellbrutes in some of the other armies against Melter. His weapon choice is really quite flexible, though I would argue that it's maybe not super outstanding for the 145 point cost, and certainly the melee things are a little bit unfortunate. Only having a 6 inch move and having to go around terrain is kind of annoying for actually getting him into combat. His special rule is that he allows you to recycle some Cabal points. If a friendly Thousand Sun Psyker uses a ritual within 9 inches, you get to immediately refund 1 Cabal point, and you can put that towards using other good ones later on. Realistically, for the amount of rituals that you might be throwing out in one phase, it's probably going to be something like two or three most of the time. And even if he did manage to do all of those within the hell route, it's still not going to be enormous. But he could at least chip in to regenerating a few of them. Realistically, I can't really see them being taken over mutaliths all that often. Maybe one of them bearing a couple of big guns as a focal point for the rituals, but probably a little bit over costed for what they really bring to the table at the moment. Otherwise, for the Thousand Sons Forge Fiend, I think this one's really quite a credible option if you just want a few heavy guns to back up the main thrust of the army. These are just 135 points, so quite a lot cheaper than the standard Chaos Space Marine one. Though admittedly their special rule is a bit worse, they don't get devastating wounds on their attacks like the Chaos ones can, or the big boosts that they get from their Dark Packs. Instead of that, they just hand out a minus one to hit against one enemy unit shot by its attacks. Not really quite as powerful in terms of raw damage dealing, but definitely not unhelpful in debuffing a potentially important enemy unit. In general, I think for a big shooty battle walker, these guys are okay with T10, 12 wounds and a 5 plus invulnerable. Most people tend to prefer the ectoplasma cannons at the moment compared with the Hades auto cannons. The ectoplasma gets you D3 shots at strength 10, AP3 and damage 3. A solid enough profile to deal with enemy medium armour, and the triple blast can be really big against things like big hordes like massed up necrons or enemy cultists and things. If you fire this at a 20 model squad, you get a massive plus 12 shots from the ectoplasma, and kind of hilariously tripling its damage output against hordes like that. Out of the Thousand Sons vehicles, I would rate this as one of the best right now if you want some dedicated fire support, perhaps most competing with things like War Dog Brigands out of the Codex, or Predator Annihilators if you want some dedicated anti-tank. Otherwise, there's the Mauler Fiend for 140 points, a similar defensive profile to the Thousand Sons Forge Fiend. You strike with 6 attacks at strength 14, AP2, and a big damage D6 plus 1 in combat, probably one that you most want to try charging things like knights with potentially, though having slightly low AP is a bit unfortunate for it, and then you can back it up with your choice of either 4 close range magma cutters for some melter shots at close range, or lasher tendrils for a bunch of anti horde in combat. I don't think it's too bad for the 140 points, a nice dedicated melee mauler. Could hit extra hard if you can spare a command point for tank shock, though its special rule I think is a little bit lackluster, getting heroic intervention for 0 CP. If that comes up it could be pretty big, but most of the time it won't. I feel like with a lot of Thousand Sons vehicles they maybe just don't really play into the core strategy that they usually want to go around. I feel like a mauler fiend maybe isn't a terrible addition though, if you just want something to be a big distraction throwing itself towards the enemy. Again, if it is competing directly with the Mutalith Beasts though, they're probably going to win out one for one. Next up we've got the Defiler at a big pricey 200 points, 14 wounds at toughness 10, melee that's kind of similar to the Mauler Fiends but at a big strength 16, and then a bunch of different guns including a battle cannon at strength 10, AP 1 and damage 3. Its rule is that it can scuttle over some slightly bigger terrain with 4 inches, though it doesn't actually have all that much movement to start with, making that a little bit lacklustre. And overall I would say that the Defiler is probably a bit overcosted right now, could afford to come down fairly significantly I think. The same is probably true of the Helldrake, 195 points here for an aircraft with hover. On the defensive side it's just not all that strong, 12 wounds at toughness 9 isn't that great, 
As the two profiles, I'd probably prefer the Bale Flamer over the Auto Cannon. The Ignore's cover plus Auto Hitting, I think, outweighs the strength difference. But perhaps the best thing about it might be the Helldrake Claws melee it has. You could potentially move this thing 20 inches, charge into the combat with something with the Fly keyword, and then you get to hit with 5 attacks that hit at strength 7 and damage 2, and devastating wounds on a 2 plus against anything that has the fly keyword. That could be fairly savage, and you'd probably average something around 6 mortal wounds against most fly targets, making it actually genuinely fairly good there. Your opponent might not have any fly keyword units though, or they might well be screened out of easy charges for it, and even then I feel like it might well just get shot down fairly easily if it's just thrown itself in the front of the enemy army. It does allow you to strip cover from an enemy unit, which isn't nothing, but again, probably not quite worth it, not at the 200 plus points it is, when mostly its damage output is going to be kind of lacklustre. Next up, we've got the Thousand Suns Land Raider for 250 points, a big transport capacity of 12 for a Toughness 12 2 plus save tank. It gets those fairly scary Soul Shatter Las Cannons that will chip in with a bit of anti armor duty. The Thousand Suns don't have a whole load of long ranged anti tank unless you take Forge Fiends or Predators or something. And it does get the Inferno boost to get an extra pip of AP on the Twin Heavy Bolter and the Combi Bolters. As with the other factions, the main role of the Land Raider is its Assault Ramp. Move forward, drop a unit, and then you can charge them into combat, paying a fairly big premium and throwing a fancy tank up the board to give a very, very long charge threat range to something that's really punchy. Realistically, for Thousand Suns, that's probably only going to be Scarab Occult Terminators that really fit the bill. I feel like in general, you probably want them on the board during the command phase. You ideally might want them in bigger numbers as well to layer the fancy buffs on them, and they can pretty easily get exactly where they need to go without paying for a Land Raider, maybe Deep Striking, plus or minus Rapid Ingress, or perhaps using that Umbrellific Crystal. I feel like for them, their melee isn't actually so great that it's massively worth making sure that they can charge with absolute guarantee. So in general, you're probably just best off taking more Scarab Occult Terminators and not taking the Land Raider at all. Not saying that you probably couldn't make it work with a Terminator Squad plus a Sorcerer, but I feel like in general it's going to be a little bit less strong than just taking more Scarabs. Next up, for 120 points, there's the Thousand Suns Predator Annihilator. Kind of medium durability with 11 wounds, toughness 10 and no invulnerable save, and striking with a trio of LAS cannons plus a couple of small arms. For anti-tank firepower for the cost, it's not terrible for 120 points. You get to re-roll damage results of worn against vehicle or monster targets, which helps it a bit. With average rolling with its twin linked on its turret weapon, you get an average of around about 6 or 7 wounds turn on turn against a toughness 10 3 plus save vehicle. That's all done at a fairly long range as well, so not too bad for the cost. Definitely one option that I think is at least somewhat credible if you just want some absolutely focused anti-tank firepower, and it's fairly cheap at 120 points to the extent where it's not taking too much away from the rest of the army. I'd probably rank the Annihilator over the Predator Destructor. This one's 125 points, so a little bit worse, though I feel like the Predator Auto Cannon just isn't really as exciting as the last cannons. A bit more generalist, and perhaps a little bit better against clearing infantry. The Thousand Suns do get some Inferno Heavy Bolters to amp up the AP on the side sponsons a bit, plus you could get them up to AP3 if they target infantry models, as that again improves the AP again. Overall, again, I'd say it's not awful for the cost. I feel in general, though, that Thousand Suns have got a lot of options for clearing infantry quite efficiently with things like Warp Flamers or Inferno Combi Bolters. Buying in a whole tank that's just more dedicated to the same sort of thing it just seems a little bit questionable, really. Next up, we've got the Thousand Suns Vindicator, 200 points, so again, really quite a lot more expensive than most. Toughness 11, a 2 plus save, and 11 wounds. Overall, I feel like per the numbers, it's probably actually losing out a little bit to the Predators at the moment, even if you can get the Demolisher Cannon in range, which is a little bit harder than, say, with Predator Las Cannons. You're only averaging around about 8 or 9 wounds to that same vehicle that we talked about earlier. For the points increase, that's maybe not quite as impressive, I suppose the Vindicator is arguably a little bit more general purpose, having the Blast keyword to help it out against bigger hordes. It can fire Blast in combat as well, and does so without taking the minus one penalty, so maybe not the worst tank to have on the front lines. Overall, I'd say not massively significantly better or worse than the Predator, though probably the extra range does outweigh it a bit for me. Though I do find the idea of doing something silly like doing Temporal Surge on it for a massive great big 20-inch move could be kind of fun, zooming it all the way up the board and getting line of sight on something unexpected, and hopefully flattening a light vehicle or something with the Demolisher Cannon. Realistically, probably not the best investment of points, but sounds kind of fun. Finally, we've got the Thousand Suns Rhino, 75 points for a cheap vehicle to deliver your Rubric Marines to the front. 
It transports 12 with a 12 inch movement and it's got toughness 9 at 10 wounds and it's auto repairability. Weapons wise it fires with an Inferno Combi Bolter plus Havoc Launcher and it's got firing deck 2 so you could fire a Soul Reaper cannon and maybe some Warp Flamers out the top. It can at least be a bit of a threat to light infantry as it moves up. I guess perhaps the best idea with the Rhino would be to take a big squad of Rubik Marines with the Warp Flamers, move them up to the midboard and then jump them out and then roast the enemy on the objectives. That one seems like at least a fairly reasonable plan to me if you want to deliver objective control and warp flamers to take some points and then after that the cheap rhino could just go on to be a bit more of a disruption or distraction unit or run around trying to do tactical objectives. Overall for that role I think delivering 10 warp flamers to the front isn't the worst thing in the world. I guess it might be not 100% necessary though if you want to just teleport them around with that umbralefic crystal or if you could sacrifice some cabal points to do a temporal surge on them to just double move them into the middle of the board. That way you could perhaps save yourself a transport and spend the points on something else. Overall I'd say that vehicles were never really going to be the central focus of a Thousand Sons army. Certainly out of the vehicles, monsters and heavy lifters, I feel like the Mutalith Vortex Beast really is the star of the show. Very efficient stats all the way around. Then besides that, for the more usable ones, I think I'd rate things like the Forge Fiend with Ectoplasma, Predator Annihilators for a bit of anti-tank, or the Rhino to deliver some Warp Flamers. They all seem fairly usable as well. In any case, with the vehicles talked about, that's the end of the Thousand Sons Index. Overall, really quite a cool book at the moment, I think, with some really interesting options. I think they've done well to keep the vast majority of the unique options for the faction usable. Most of their unique stuff, I think, is at least fairly good. Perhaps units like the Infernal Master and the Zangors being a bit more niche than most at the moment. Having had a look at a fair few competitive lists before this, it does seem that a lot of them are running Magnus, plus really quite a big cast of characters leading small squads of rubrics or scarab units. Most of the various flavours of regular Thousand Suns sorcerers tend to be inspiring people to take them, and then there's often the big block of scarab occult terminators to layer some massive buffs on, or maybe some big units of warp flamers delivered with the umbralefic crystal, or maybe temporal surging them. Otherwise the Zangor and Lighten seem really quite nice for nipping around doing secondary objectives and throwing in anywhere between 1 and 3 Mutalith Vortex Beasts is really going to be a bad move with just how efficient they are. Quite nice to see the Thousand Suns doing well but not being at the absolute top of the tree to the extent where they're causing huge problems. I feel like their index is in a fairly good place at the moment. In any case let me know what you think of the army, what's been working for you on the tabletop so far, looking forward to hearing any other Thousand Suns insights or anything I might have missed. If you have enjoyed the video then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, I'll certainly keep regular videos coming like this and I'll definitely be looking to make a Thousand Sons unit tier list at some stage in the future. Finally if you've been enjoying the videos on the channel and you'd like to help support keeping them coming, I would just like to mention that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page as well and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some really big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening and I'll hope to see you guys next time.